All right, all right, I'll talk about Mandalorian. All right, so Disney Plus has happened. The Empire has grounded its roots into the streaming service world. One of the shows is The Mandalorian. I didn't watch the pilot episode when it premiered, because like I said in other videos, I'm like, Disney Plus, I don't know, I just kind of want to hold out on that. But man, you guys really wanted me to talk about this, so I guess I'll talk about it. So how was the pilot episode of The Mandalorian? It was okay. I'm just kidding. I'm messing with you. It was actually quite sweet. Because it was just, it was simple. It kept it in the pocket. It's this Mandalorian bounty hunter doing a couple missions. You know it's gonna get larger scale as the show goes on, but for now I'm gonna bask in the fact that it's just a smaller story about someone navigating the criminal underworld of the Star Wars universe. That world's always interested me. That's why I like the beginning of Return of the Jedi. I know it gets a lot of flack because people are like Jabba's pals. They don't like it, but even as a kid, I always liked it. It was this neat look into the criminal underworld of Star Wars. I was like, I, I want that. When I played Star Wars Galaxies back when you had to grind to become a bounty hunter, I did it. I did the grind, I became the bounty hunter. That was back when you couldn't even do bounties on players, which is really what I wanted to do. And I spent 95% of my time in that game on Tatooine. It's just, I like the outer rim, it's, I like the sand, it's coarse, it's rough, it's irritating, and it's awesome. And it gets everywhere. But I loved Pedro Pascal as the Mandalorian. You know him as Prince Oberon in Game of Thrones. Well, you knew him until they turned his head into SpaghettiOs. But at first, he, he doesn't talk, and you're like, all right, I guess he's not gonna talk, But and you can make that work. You can make a show with a lead that doesn't talk, you can make it work if you can make it work, to state the obvious. But then he starts talking and a lot of personality shines through that helmet where you can't see his face. At first, you know, he walks into a bar and he just stares, he's like that gunslinger, he doesn't talk, he's just there. Then he might say a couple things to the person he's here to collect. And then every scene, he shows a little more personality. A lot of times, these Boba Fett-ish characters, they just, they stand there and well, I guess Boba Fett's the only one who really does. But he's got more personality than I was expecting to get. And I liked it when he met IG-11, not only because of the dynamic of those two bounty hunters meeting, but it shows why an IG unit is to be feared. Back in the 90s, the shadows of the Empire Age, the IG-88 was quite feared. He was one of the popular villains in Star Wars canon. And this shows why, for all the reasons we saw in the trailers, his torso's turning, his arms are turning, he's just pinpoint shooting people in the head. Pretty much how robots should be in shows and movies, where it's like, dude, they gotta have target lock, right? Why do they miss ever? And I like and appreciate the fact that the show doesn't try too hard, you know? It does feel like a Star Wars show. It does feel like it takes place in the Star Wars universe. But that scene where he meets up with Carl Weathers in a cantina, you don't hear the song, dun, 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 classic, but it can't play around the clock in every cantina in the galaxy, can it? And they didn't try to fill it in with another song. <laughs> or whatever that song is. It was just a meeting in a cantina. And that's that. It didn't do a wink and a nod at the camera. I do appreciate that at this point. Granted, he still does freeze people in carbonite. That is a bit of a wink, I'll, I'll admit. Empire Strikes Back, it felt like it was like, oh, what do we have? Carbonite, it's a makeshift solution. Let's just do that. Now I guess that's just the way bounty hunters do it. Then again, this takes place after Return of the Jedi, so maybe word got around. That's a very efficient way to do it. So, all right, that, that actually does make sense. In the end, The Mandalorian's probably as good as you've heard it is. It has a great lead character and there's build up to his personality. And it looks great. It looks sharp. It's in HDR. Is that 4K stuff? That helps. Really gorgeous though. There was one part with these little CGI. They look like piranhas, but with two legs and they're in the desert and you ride them. And I was like, okay, this is where the the budget's being trimmed. <laughs> Starting to see the CGI here, all right. My real complaint about the pilot episode is the complaint I figured I would have, which is why I didn't watch it because I just wanted to binge it all when it came out. Because this episode leaves you with, all right, he did a couple things, but I want to see more right now. Maybe it's because I'm conditioned to binging because that's how shows did it after Netflix did it. It's like shows were always like, oh, week to week, that's the way. Netflix was like, boom, this is the cool way to do it all at once. We're back to week to week, that's how the cool kids do it. All right, I guess I'm back to week to week. So this is what I suggest doing. I guess you get a seven day free trial of Disney Plus. When it's all out, get your free trial, binge The Mandalorian, and then bounce. The Mandalorian has gotten his mark. It's little Baby Yoda. And he was like, well, I don't want to kill Baby Yoda. We don't know the kid's name yet. So we're all just going to call him Baby Yoda or her. We don't know. And Jawas have stripped his ship of parts. So he's like, well, I need my parts back. So Jawas are like, all right, can you go get this egg? So he's like, all right, I guess I got to get the egg. So that's the thing. Mandalorian has to go get this egg of a creature, bring it back to the Jawas. Jawas will give him the parts for his ship if he does. And here we go. Which people have said, and it's totally true, the Mandalorian does come across. It plays out like a Star Wars video game. He does missions. He gets armor upgrades video game. That's probably why I like it a bit. I have good memories of good Star Wars video games. And when I don't get you a timely review, of Jedi Fallen Order is just because I'm playing Death Stranding right now. So that'll take me nine years, so that's that. But this episode does play out like a video game as well. Not even counting the fact that he decides to scale the Jawa Sandcrawler and I was like, 
I've played Super Star Wars. This is gonna suck for you. And it plays out exactly like it did in Super Star Wars for me. He almost gets to the top, he gets smacked, he falls down, now he's back at square one. That's pretty much that level. But as The Mandalorian is playing out like a video game, this is that video game segment that is just, it's the XP grind. It is like that MMO or delivery game where it's like, all right, yeah, you have the package, but you can't leave yet. You need to do this one other mission. You're like, ah. Fine, tack on a mission to this mission. Video game 101. Funny thing about Baby Yoda, it did enter my mind in episode one. I was like, what if this doesn't take place after Return of the Jedi? It just says the empire has fallen. What if it's like the Sith empire and this is old Republic era and that's actually little Yoda and Jedi are gonna pick him up at the end of the show. However, there are stormtroopers that you see in this show are ex stormtroopers. And that design of stormtrooper, as I understand, is an Emperor Palpatine empire design. Odds are Yoda just got busy in that outer rim. Yoda having sex, he doesn't have sex. It's a weird thought. However, Yoda and Yaddle, they were on the council together. Things happen. Then a printout of all the freak nasty sexting those two did back and forth hit the internet and that's the real reason Yoda went into exile on Dagobah. And now we know. You know what cracks me up in Star Wars is how easily people forget about the Jedi and the Force. Han Solo's like hokey religions and ancient weapons, that one commander talking to, talking to Darth Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion. It's like all of this stuff existed and was very prominent in the galaxy in their lifetime. How easily we forget. It's like anything mystical or force related happens. People are like, what is that? What does that mean? I don't know what happened. I, I have no idea. I can't explain it. It's not like for over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice of the old Republic. I, I don't know. So this episode entertained me. It's just, I, I'm concerned about the runtime. 30 minutes long. You could have had this at the end of the pilot episode and had one episode that was about an hour and seven minutes long. Are the rest of the episodes going to be a half an hour long? I, I'd like a little more. Because as I've seen from this episode, half hour long episodes kind of just feel like filler episodes. And now I got to think, why are you drawing the episodes out? Are you making your show have more episodes than it actually should have? Having eight episodes per season is it better for you financially than four episodes still entertained i still like the character of the mandalorian i'm still intrigued as to what's going on which the intrigue is a big part of star wars entertainment so i'm glad they have that just in a show that's only eight episodes long i don't feel like there's time to have episodic episodes filler episodes every episode should probably push it forward a bit so as it stands right now the mandalorian episode two was a good first part of the second episode of the mandalorian and i guess we'll see the second part of the second episode called the third episode episode next week. All right, so the Mandalorian episode two, we will call it the XP grind or the mission on the mission. Man, that Mandalorian beats in my head. Doom, do, 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 do. I like it. All right, so episode three of The Mandalorian, it's hit Disney Plus. I saw it, now I talk about it. I'm saying there's light spoilers on this one too. I don't tell you exactly what happens, but there's some implication and there's enough to where it's like, yeah, take a half an hour out of your day, go watch it and then come back here and get my thoughts. So this being a 30 minute long episode, again, this is not much to talk about, but there's enough to talk about. And this episode, the 30 minute time frame, it didn't bother me as much, probably because I've been binging Gargoyles, which let's face it, that's the best reason to get Disney Plus if you're gonna get it. They got some good stuff on there, but it's like Batman the Animated Series, which is not a Disney Plus, and, and Gargoyles. Those are like top tier 90s animations. Grand Spider-Man, X-Men, the other ones. But those are top two for me. But in this episode, again, simple premise. He's going to turn in the package and he has to decide whether or not he's okay with that. He's gonna hold to the code and be like, all right, yeah, the code's the code, the job's the job or if he's gonna have a crisis of conscience about it. Which is always a great thing to put your characters through because, you know, we gotta see some humanity. And the thing about the Mandalorian is that he, he shows a lot of that humanity. Throughout the show so far, these three episodes, the thing you get is that he's not just some unstoppable badass Mandalorian. There's even a scene in here where there are a lot of other Mandalorians in the room with him and you're like, God, just by looking at them and by attitude, you feel like these guys are bigger than him and maybe he could beat them in a fair fight. But it really does feel like the jocks surrounding just the average kid in school. Maybe the average kid can throw down and know how to fight, but he's not the biggest of them. You don't feel like he's like, I am some unstoppable Mandalorian badass sentinel. My religion is built around armor and weapons. Yes, that's how I carry myself. I'm the biggest and the best. It just looks like a normal dude who just happens to be a Mandalorian. Granted, I don't know much about my Mandalorian lore. I'll be the first to admit it, so maybe you can help me out. But even in the flashbacks, 
where it shows who I assume are his parents running from droids. They don't seem to be wearing Mandalorian armor, so I, I don't know at what point you pick up the Mandalorian armor and now that's your religion, but it really feels like he, he wasn't born into it, he just kind of adopted it at an older age. In every episode of The Mandalorian so far, all three of them, he has run into a situation that's too much for him and it's some other force that gets him out of it. He worked with IG-11 to get out of the situation in episode one. Without Yoda baby raising the big rhino, he'd have died in episode two. I love the fact that he was gonna go out with his little butter knife, but he was still gonna die. Yoda baby got him out of it. In this episode, the same thing happens. He's in a firefight that's too much for him. He cannot get out of it. I like the fact that this show shows that mortality with the Mandalorian. Not that he's not badass in a fight. He's completely shown that he is, but he doesn't try to step up to people and try to posture like he is the biggest and the best. Generally speaking, he just wants to do the job, get paid and go home, which is why this episode character wise is so important. In a weird way, he kind of reminds me of Malcolm Reynolds from Firefly. He's not the biggest dude, but he's badass in his own right. And for the most part, you leave him alone, he'll leave you alone. He's got no need to beat you. He just wants to be on his way. But he has a bigger heart than maybe even he thought he had. And that heart is no doubt gonna get him wrapped up in something much bigger. And a lot of that credit is from the personality that comes through mostly from body language. Granted with the scenarios that are written around him and how he deals with them. If that's actually Pedro Pascal under that helmet, he's doing good work. And that's got me loving this show. So three episodes in, I'm digging the Mandalorian, just a guy and his telepathic Yoda clone baby. I mean, was that the first attempt? Was that Palpatine 50 years ago? So that predates the Phantom Menace? Was that Palpatine being like, I've cloned the greatest Jedi of all time. I will make him my apprentice and a Jedi will, f wait, what? How long does it take? They age that slowly? I think I'm just gonna make a clone army of Jango Fett warriors and then embed an order into their brains that I can activate at the opportune moment. Yes, that's... That's probably quicker. So I'm really liking The Mandalorian. I feel like I'm still in the introductory phase of his character. They could do stuff in this season that completely makes me go, oh, okay, this is whatever. Or they can do stuff in season two that does the same thing. But for right now, The Mandalorian is one of the more compelling things I've seen from Star Wars in a while. All right, so The Mandalorian episode three titled The Sin. Have you seen it? What did you think about it? Whatever you thought, comment below, let me know. And as always, if you like what you've seen here and you want to see more, click right here to see more.